Hello, everyone. My name is Tim Russell, Vice President, Community Engagement and Diversity, Equity and Inclusion for WTTW and WFMT. And welcome to Inventing Improv, a behind the scenes preview and discussion. Premiering tomorrow night at 8 p.m. on all WTTW platforms. Inventing Improv is the newest documentary and website in WTTW's Chicago Story series, uncovering Chicago's fascinating history and reflecting the rich diversity and breadth of human experience that shaped this great American city. I hope you will tune in tomorrow night and also explore our companion website at wttw.com slash improv. Out of all the things Chicago is known for, our greatest cultural export just might be improv theater, which was born at Jane Addams Hull House during the Great Depression and carried out into the world by the likes of Bill Murray, Tina Fey, and Stephen Colbert. This new documentary explores the life and legacy of Viola Spolin, the social worker turned theater guru known as the mother of improv. During this exclusive virtual event, we'll go behind the scenes with producer and writer, Jude Leak, who will lead a conversation with Aretha Seals, granddaughter of Viola Spolin, and daughter of Second City co-founder, Paul Seals. Emmy Award and Golden Globe Award winner, Alan Alda, Academy Award nominee, Bob Balaban, actress, producer, writer, and comedian, Frances Collier, comedian actress, Angela V. Shelton, and historian, Mark Larson. WTTW is committed to producing and presenting trusted best-in-class content fueled by distinctly Chicago sensibility. And our purpose is to enrich lives, engage communities, and inspire exploration. Our, our mission and purpose would not be possible without our donors and members. Thank you to the Nagani Foundation and the Jim and Kay Maybe family for their lead support of Chicago Stories. Thank you as well to Walter E. Heller Foundation. Special thanks to the Abra and Jim Wilkins Fund for their support of Inventing Improv, a Chicago Story special. Thank you as well to Denny and Sandy Cummings and Sonia T. Marshak and Susan A. Schwartz. And finally, I would like to thank the loyal WTTW members and the audience with us this evening. Now, I hope you enjoy and please roll the video. <laughs> Coming up. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Second City. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. It's one of Chicago's greatest exports. The Second City. This new kind of comedy that hadn't existed before. And it wasn't in New York. It was here in Chicago. Just look at the roster of the people that have come out of Second City in television and film, everything. But improv wasn't invented by a funny man. Viola Spolin is the mother of improvisation. Viola's name should be known by everybody. I don't care what kind of improvisational cake you're making. At the base of it, the layers, the cake itself is Spolin. Viola Spolin laid improv's foundation while working with immigrant children at Chicago's Hull House. Hull House is ground zero. It's the big bang for improvisational theater in America. From there, the art form catapulted to the international stage. This kind of theater that she came up with ended up changing not only American theater, but film and television. At the Second City, at the Groundlings, at UCB, at all of these improvisational theaters. It really started here, it started with Viola. Inventing Improv, next on Chicago Stories. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, Tim. Hello and welcome. Uh, to WTTW's Inventing Improv, a behind the scene preview and discussion. Thank you for spending your evening with us. I'm Jude Leak, producer and writer of WTTW's Inventing Improv, a Chicago story special. All of you out there tuning in, feel free to jump into the conversation with your questions and comments using the chat function. And I'll pass them along to our panelists a little bit later in the show. Um, and now speaking of our panelists, 
we have, I'd like to thank artist Alan Alda, Bob Balaban, Francis Collier, Angela V. Shelton, author of Ensemble and Oral History of Chicago Theater, Mark Larson, the granddaughter of Viola Spolin, the daughter of Paul Sills, the co-creator of Second City, and the executive director of Sills Spolin Theater Works, where the work continues today, Aretha Sills. Thank you all so much for joining me tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, so Alan, I know we only have you for a few minutes, so I want to start with you. Um, please tell us about your experience, your first experience with Biola, what you learned, um, and how, how it's carried you through your career and what you're doing with it today. Well, my first experience with Biola was on the stage of Second City but not during a show. Paul Sills had invited me to do a workshop twice a week on the stage during the day when there, wasn't, when there was no audience, it wasn't being used for its regular purpose. And Paul carried Viola's book as though it were the Bible. Mm. And he would read out each exercise from the book. We, and we all approached it with great reverence. <laughs> and then, we did that for six months. I think two or three months in, Viola visited New York where we were working. It was not, we were not in the Chicago Second City, but in New York. And she came in and led, led the group for a couple of days. And, and again, it was the formulas that she had discovered and invented were what she did. She didn't improvise the teaching. The teaching was formed decades earlier. And it works like nobody's business. The reason I was on that stage working at the New York Second, uh, Second City uh, stage was that David Shepard, who had helped found uh, Compass, which was the pre-runner to, uh, forerunner to Second City, years after the original Compass started a new Compass for, uh, and during the summer at Hyannisport, in, in in the basement of the same hotel where John Kennedy was giving his press conferences upstairs in the morning and at night in the cabaret we do Second City, hmm. we would do Compass, but that was that that was my introduction to improvising. But it was guts improvising. It was throwing you being thrown out on stage and having to come up with funny and not knowing where it was coming from. There were half the show was sketches that had been born in improvisation and rehearsal, but the other half was spot improvisation. But you, you had no, nothing to draw on. You had some characters you would thought of and you could draw on the characters, but there wasn't, there wasn't a discipline to it. And when Paul invited me to do this workshop for six months, we, we found where the discipline was, which is in Vi Viola's work. And there's a tremendous difference between what her work enables you to do and what comedy improv is. As valuable as comedy improv is, it doesn't necessarily enable you to have the, the powers that Viola's work does, the strengths. And one of the greatest strengths is for me, is spontaneity and connection relating with the other performers. It's so powerful, in fact, that I realized when we were doing MASH, one of the things that helped our performances was that we would sit around in a circle and just make each other laugh, relate to one another. We weren't doing any Viola stuff because I was the only one who was in on that. But what we were getting was the benefits that Viola's work does, which is bring you together in the same space. Yeah. So that when we went on camera, we, were, we already were connected and we stayed connected using the lines of the scene. But we were more connected than we would have been if we'd stayed in our dressing rooms and come out at the last minute and started to try to act. Yes. That has been, for me, the most valuable thing that's happened to me in my life 
in terms of what I've learned as an actor. And I try to pass it on to other actors. And I realized when I was doing a television show on PBS where I was interviewing hundreds of scientists, that the reason that they were so good at explaining their work is that we made the same connection that we would make if we were doing an improv exercise that had been invented by Viola. We were connected. So when that program was over, just to answer the last part of your question, what am I doing now related to Viola? I wanted to help scientists communicate better, to get out of, out of jargon, out of their own heads, and really talk to the people who are in front of them, really write for the people who are reading them, make a personal connection, even if they can't see them or they're not near them in time and space but think of what they're going through. And what enabled us to do that is to start them off with exercises that are either based on violas or sometimes very, very much the same as violas. The exercises are all to, for the purpose of bringing the people together, reading one another's minds in a way. And to the Alder Center for Communicating Science at Stony Brook University, which has been doing this work now for 11 years, has trained 18,000 scientists and medical professionals to connect with the people that they're trying to communicate with. And we get wonderful feedback from them. It's really working. And that's thanks to Viola in a way that I don't think anybody had ever anticipated <laughs> all those years ago when she discovered this work. That's wonderful. How how did um what are the what did the games what are they trying to get what are they trying to get as, as an improviser what are they helping you to access? The, the the wonderful thing that many actors say is my performance is found in the eyes of the other actor. It's the connection. It enabled what Viola's exercises enable you to do. A lot of people think of improvising as making things up or being funny. It doesn't have to be, and it shouldn't be making things up at all, and it doesn't have to be funny. It often will be funny just because it's so spontaneous and spontaneity makes us giggle. Mm -hmm. But that connection that it brings about is enormously important because it enables you to be like a leaf in the wind and the wind is blowing from the other person. And you respond to what you're getting from them, to whatever they're going through, you're responding to at almost an unconscious level because the connection is so strong. And if they're doing that too, they're just as connected to you. And nobody knows in the room, even though you're gonna say the same lines you said last night on the same stage, nobody knows what's coming next. Not the actors, not the audience. There's an element of excitement that you wouldn't have any other way. That's, that's a tremendously important thing for, for a theatrical experience. You don't wanna see you don't want to see them running off a, a videotape of what, how they decided to do this performance. You, you, it's not interesting. It doesn't excite you. It's not like a sporting event where you don't know what's going to happen next. And that's what this enables you to do, I think. That's wonderful. I know you have another obligation, um, but I just wanted to give you a chance since you're here with Aretha. I know you guys do things together sometimes too. Um, for any final thoughts before you sign off, do you have anything you want to add? I'm so glad you're doing this. I'm so glad you made the movie because for a long, long time, I've wanted Viola's work to flower even more than it has. It's produced so many changes in the way we think of performing. I've even taught classes to string quartets. And the quartet would play a, a piece before three hours of improv and then play the same piece after three hours of improv. And they played it better. They were more together. They were more exciting. They knew it. 
and the world-class musicians listening know it. So it can, it can fix an awful lot of things. <laughs> so I'm so glad you're promoting it like this. Thank you. Thank you so much. I can't thank you enough for taking the time. I know you've got to get going, but be well. Thank you, and thank Alan. you, Alan. Thank you. I'm so sorry I got to go over it. No worries. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. So um, in keeping with, you know, first encounters, Bob. Yeah. You trained with Viola when you were a, a, a young lad. How old were you? And tell us about your experience with Viola. Okay. Well, I, I was in high school and Viola had, I believe it was called a teenage workshop. And I think we went twice a week, but it could have been once a week. And it was the highlight of my junior year of high school. Uh, and I had no idea what I was getting into. I knew about Mike and Wayne because I listened to all of their stuff all the time. Uh, but I really didn't know what I was going to be doing. A, a friend of mine at school, Robin Menken, um, who was great at doing this. I don't know if you knew Robin, but she, she was a wonderful character uh, in life and to work with. And she said, calm, you'll see what happens. I got there. Viola was electrifying in a very quiet sort of way. And all I know is we started immediately playing games with the following goal. Don't try to invent anything. Don't make stuff up. Don't write anything. And we did this for a year and it's the most fun thing I ever did. And probably one of the most helpful things that, that ever happened to me in terms of leading me towards really being an actor. Uh, and also I've used it when I improvise with uh, auditioning, sometimes two of my favorite jobs. I literally only got, <clears throat> because the director said, well, we don't have the script here, so let's just improvise a scene about blah, 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 blah. One was a play that I did with Louise Lasser called Marie and Bruce. And the two of us were actually so in, inherent on, in some way, it's a, it's a very emotionally violent play. But it, Louise and I were wildly suited to be working with each other in this aspect of things. And we improvised for about half an hour effortlessly. Mm -hmm. And the only disappointing thing was the play is beautifully written, but I never got over how much fun it was to do the play without, without knowing what the words were. It was so exciting. And it was, it was great. Uh, I've used it as a director occasionally. Um, I was in the movie The Midnight Cowboy only because... John Schlesinger said, well, John Voigt's here. Why don't we just improvise your scene? Let's see what happens when you improvise it. Which at that point was the only time I wasn't nervous was when I was improvising. If, if he gave me a script to read, I would have been, oh, oh my God. But this, this was wonderful, easy. And again, the only disappointment was it, it was great to be doing the movie. But I was like, wow, when we improvised this, <laughs> it sort of helped what we were doing. But it meant... It had been so much more really like the script had intended. I shouldn't see me saying that, but it was. Um, and I loved it. it. It was fun. It was, we even played, I don't know if anybody else here ever did this, but improvising charades. Has anybody ever done that? And it's so strange that I can't even hardly explain it. So if nobody else can do it, maybe I shouldn't veer off this path and say what it was like to improvise charades. Well, Aretha probably did. Or did, did, knows at least uh, you probably know the charades with is the one with the syllable where you act out each syllable, right? Yes, yeah, that well, that's yeah. exactly it. The word game, right? Paul used to call it the game. My dad, Paul, was yeah. a was a charades type of game she would play with her family as well. It's in the Neva Boyd book, but um, her uh, Viola's family played a lot of charades. <laughs> But um, Bob, continue that because you you talked about it a little bit when we inter when I interviewed you. Right. But, you know, it was like you would have to break down each of the syllables. You can. It was like ahead. regular charades in one sense, but in the other sense, you actually had to act out each of the syllables because each syllable you had to find something about it that you could act out. It was very mystical because it didn't look like you were communicating anything, but. The magic when it happened was always that your subconscious took over because you allowed it to. And to me, everything Alan said was brilliant and wonderful. But the part that he didn't exactly mention, because you can't mention everything all at once, was a big goal of this is to get your consciousness out of the way and allow, you know, where you came from, you know, where you're going, but you don't know what you're going to say and what the other person is going to say. 
And there was even a game that we played that I especially loved was the, was making a play where two or three of the people in the class were off stage doing sound and lights and basically sound and lights. And the rest of us were on stage and we got, we, and when the sound and lights did something, we had to include that in the improv improvisation we were doing. And the sound and lights had to improvise what we were doing. And after a little while of doing this, the magic became who went first. We didn't, we finally couldn't really have any idea whether they, the, the offstage was leading us or were we leading the offstage. And that to me has always been in all acting and all everything, the fun of the fun of it, because it's got to be fun. Mm -hmm. That's why it's playing, right? That's why yeah. she always called it a game. Um, <laughs> you know, what I would like to know, like you talked eloquently in the film too about what the games are um, freeing you from. Do you want to kind of tell us about for you, what it, how it freed you? Well, when you're, I, I had, I began my first training of any kind was with Viola and I didn't, I didn't work with Una Hagen until I was like three or four years older. And in between, I did do some acting and my habits were getting worse and worse and worse. And the only thing that was my saving grace was if I could go back to some form of speaking the character's inner life, which is improvising because you can't decide your character's inner life. You just have to say it. And that very frequently brought me back to some starting place. It made me feel like I could do something. Uh, it made me feel alive. Uh, and it helped teach me without telling me so what good acting was and what good acting wasn't without ever being lectured to. And that, that it, it, it really, it did stick with me. And there are millions of other ways I could say I, I was directing a play years ago and one of the character, one of the people in it was having trouble accessing his part and we converted the play to an imaginary scene that had happened before the play began and before we did the play every day before rehearsal we would spend an hour acting out or not acting out we living in this other situation which for everybody it was only a four person play or three per person play, it opened it up for everybody. And there were days when we never came back from the situation before the play began. And the play got richer and richer and richer by giving us a grounding that made us feel honest all the time. Hmm. Oh, wow, that's great. Um, well, the games did lay the foundation for improvisation. Um, Aretha, can you talk uh, about Viola's philosophy behind the games a bit? Um, what was the ultimate intention and what was she trying to get the players to tap into? Oh, that's a big, big question. So I'll try to be brief, but um, the very first words of um, improvisation for the theater are a, a really nice distillation of her philosophy. Um, chapter one, creative experience. She says, everyone can act, everyone can improvise, anyone who wishes to can play in the theater and learn to become stage worthy. Um, and she goes on to say that we learn through experience and experiencing and no one teaches anyone anything, right? right. So if the whole method um, is devised to allow the player the freedom to experience, right? Which means that the side coach is not, that is a side coach, not a teacher. The side coach is there, she describes this, is a fellow player. And um, we just sort of let the games proceed and and try to bring people back on track when they lose focus, like a third base coach, she describes it. So she described her teaching method as non-authoritarian, non-psychological and non-verbal, which is a tough thing to pull off, but it she, did, she does. Mm. Um, so basically every time um, she was, she had quite a bit of traditional theatrical training um and she was she was interested in being in the theater from a very young age and um, but when she after working you know as a social worker she was working teaching dramatics to what she called everyday people or uh, your average people she was working with non-actors um, many of them english was new to them as well and all ages kids um kids and adults, any group that would have her really, she was working with. So she would, needed to devise an, a system of actor training 
that would um, be useful for them. And, and she knew that a game could solve some of the problems of, uh, of imparting what she needed to impart to them. So she, when she had a problem directing, she um, rather than telling the players what to do, she would create a game and each game has a focus. Um, and the focus allows uh, allows the players to get out of the head and into the space and sort of calms us down and you know gets our our um, the 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 body and the brain ready to play right because when you're being looked at that fight or flight thing kicks in and you lose mm -hmm. all your sensory equipment goes you can't see hear yeah, any of that and so her games do this lovely work of just bringing us back into the present time and act and we can act where we can you know experience the world you know while we're being looked at like paul would say don't pretend to be human be human you know so her her work helps us be human um and and access the intuition that's that's kind of state of flow where they, we, we can access our intuition and then we have everything we need to play we don't need anything else Wow, and la and Sorry, yeah, la the last thing I want to say about her, her is that her games don't give rules to make a scene work. She just game by game, she gives groups the tools through playing the game, through the experience to create something spontaneously as a group, okay. if that makes sense. No, it's great. <clears throat> so through her work and her collaboration with her son, Paul Stills, and a bunch of extremely talented artists, um, the Compass and then Second City launched this new theatrical movement that caught like wildfire. Um, Francis and Angela, you're both Second City alums. Um, you've worked extensively with improvisers from all over different styles. Um, can you both talk about what Viola's training have done for you individually um, and also uh, kind of compare what it's like to work with others that haven't been trained in her methods. Do you, who wants to start, Angela? Uh, sure, I think that, um, well, I'll use the, the second question really. I was like, ooh, <laughs> um, uh, cause it's meant a lot. I mean, I think when you have this, when you play these games and when you have this training and this background, it's this language, right? That supersedes all your other languages and you, it's people often, we're a duo, we do stand up together, we perform together. And one of the things people often say is that we have this great rhythm and it's, it's because of Viola, it's because of this training. And a lot of people think it's because we're best friends and we spend all of our time together. So we, it really isn't that. We cannot talk for you know days, weeks, whatever, and just, it happens and it's from those games. Yes, yes. You know, what improvisation teaches you, and everybody has said it, is group consciousness. Uh, and that is in how to flow within group consciousness. It is, it's like birds, it's like a murmuration. And there you're following the follower, right? And that is what it, it gives you. There, there is no leader, but everybody is leading when they need to. Yeah. And um when you embrace that uh, philosophy down to your cellular level, what happens is it makes you a better person. Not just, we haven't gotten to performer. It makes you a better person. It opens you up, allows you to receive uh, mm -hmm. and expands you in such a way that then when you go to the stage and perform, you're able to flow in that way. Um, because it doesn't, it, you know, it isn't just a thing that kind of happens on stage. Right. You, it's working uh, that you have to do as a human mm -hmm. to be to be a better performer. Mm. Did you say it was a practice? It is Absolutely. nothing but practice. Absolutely, and you can use it everywhere. And I would say when you're the second part of your question about what it's like to to perform with people or to work with people who haven't had this training, you know, I think that you one of the basic things is this this sort of the mimicking or the getting into spirit with someone being open to them and 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 being open to what they're giving it works no matter what their level of training or not training is the place that i see it that i've found that sometimes a little bit of rub is when you come into some other people other people other improv theaters mm -hmm. and um and i feel like second city stayed 
very true to this history and uh into this these this sort of the games and all of that and um all those things are great they're wonderful but they're a little bit different sometimes and the thing about second city is that we get in an improv in viola getting grounded in the activity and the environment and the reality of that like really building that from the granular level makes it so much more powerful when you work with other people even no matter where they are and sometimes when you're when i think there are a lot of people particularly outside of the improv world who think improvisation means talking a lot <laughs> and that they just you know just keep talking like i remember hearing that like you know or reading that shia labeouf had been was improvising in this movie and then i was like oh he just talked a lot like <laughs> nobody else got to talk and that was what people thought improv was mm -hmm. wow that's great thank you guys <clears throat> um mark mm -hmm. um chicago today has a um, international theater reputation i mean some of the most acclaimed regional theaters in the world um and much has been said about the chicago aesthetic Oh. Um, can you explain a little about what that is and what role Viola and Paul and their peers played in helping to establish that? Yeah, I, I would say you cannot separate the Chicago aesthetic from the work of Paul and Viola Spolin. And I'll, I'll say something about that in just a second. If you'll indulge me, I've got to say how moving it was to watch Aretha Sills listen to Bob and Alan talk about the work of her family. Um, you know, they, they both talked about their, their origin story with it, how they came into contact with it, um, the impact it have, had on them, and the way they, they've carried it on and passed it on too. Um, that, I think, is how alive this work is. And the fact that you're spotlighting that, I think, is wonderful from wh whence it came. The Chicago aesthetic, um, I, I want to talk about it just in terms of Paul and Viola's work, how it comes together, because um, they, they are inseparable. I, at one point, I asked the, the, the great uh, uh, Richard Christensen, the Chicago Tribune theater critic, who was so instrumental in the, the burgeoning the, uh, theater scene in Chicago, I said, if, if there was one person whose absence, you know, it would have an impact on uh, Chicago theater. If they had never happened, who would that be? And without a pause, he said, Paul Sills. Paul Sills. And there would be no Paul Sills without Viola Spolin, you know, biologically, of course. Mm -hmm. But we, could, we can conjecture in just in terms of, of uh, professionally, too. Would he have been the person that he is without Viola Spolin? So it, it's, it's so connected. Um, I could add, you know, all the, the Chicago aesthetic really is about the things that we've been hearing from Angela and from Francis and Aretha and Bob and Alan already. It's, you know, it's the engagement with the group. It's finding your own life in the eyes of, of the other, that kind of thing. Um, but I could also add a, a couple things. One is there's this like do-it-yourself ethos in Chicago. It's, you know, Paul and, and his cohort there at the University of Chicago, in the absence of any kind of um, uh, theater department at the University of Chicago, created their own. Mm -hmm. They just decided we're going to do it, you know, and, and they did. And creating a space where they, which wasn't des designated theater space was, was important too. And it obviously carries on in, in Chicago these days. When you think of uh, Playwrights Theater Club that he started with David Shepard at the University of Chicago, when they moved off campus, they moved into a um, Chinese restaurant. The, the second city itself started in a laundry. It was a laundry. You know, that kind of thing is, I think, part of the aesthetic of Chicago. When you talk about Chicago aesthetic, do it yourself, find a place, just go do it. You know, it's, it's so many other things too. It's, it's taking risks, you know, being willing to take risks. And Chicago creates a, is, is a place that creates opportunity to take risks where if, if you fail, it's not the end of everything. And I think that gives way to lots of innovation 
you know, if you can take those risks. Gosh, it's, there's so much in terms of, of, of all of that, you know, that, that aesthetic. Um, and, it, and the other thing I'd like to say is that it continues today because so many people have been so devoted to it. You can think of, of the great Sheldon Patinkin, who was 17 years old at Playwrights Theater Club with all those folks and in direct contact with Paul and Viola. He carried that work on until his recent death and passed it on to just numerous people, countless people, right? Including the Steppenwolf Theater in their formative years. He was highly influential carrying on their work to them. So all, uh, you know, Aretha and Carol Sills, what the work that they're doing, obviously, the uh, Piven Theater Workshop, you know, these, these are ways that it carries on. Uh, the, la the last thing I'd like to say is, um, um, I sat several times and watched Joyce Piven, who was part of Playwrights Theater Club, and is quite, quite devoted to the work of, of Sills and Spohan. And I watched her teaching, and I, it made me misty-eyed. It's not that hard to make me misty-eyed, but it made me misty-eyed thinking, I wonder if these young people have any idea how close they are to the source. They're one step removed. And I, I think that's really important. So I'm, I'm glad this work is happening so that people can say, see, it started with Viola's goal. Yeah. And I, I weren't, and I don't know this, and maybe you can answer, and I might have this wrong, but. I, I want to say that without without Viola, Paul, and Carol, um, the laws that prevented storefront theaters wouldn't have been changed. Did they did, did they have any? Wasn't there something about the the after the success of Second City um, that Mayor Daley finally said, "Oh, okay, I can make some money. <laughs> we can make some money." And were the were the 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 restrictions? change so that storefront theaters, what Chicago is really, really known for, thrive? It's, it's a little different from that. It was actually organic theater that okay. started expanding things. And, um, but organic theater came to Chicago at the invitation of Paul Sills okay. too. But, but, but second, I think what you might be thinking about is the fact that um, there were all these fire laws because of the uh, Iroquois fire. Right. And Second City created Second City as a cabaret. And you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, Rita, but they created it as a cabaret so they wouldn't have to follow some of the same rules, you know, just in terms of having a fire curtain and that kind of thing. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, I, I, I just feel like it's it started it. It started that movement. All right, I'm sorry. We have to um, um, go. There are some other stories about that with Paul, but... Look for another time. Okay. okay, yeah, I know I'm getting my little dings coming in about what I need to do now, so I'm going to follow <laughs> my directions. Um, all right, so we have um, a trail, you know, we have a, um, a clip that I want to show you, but before we need a little bit backstory, uh, Aretha, real quick, can you give us a little backstory on Neva Boyd and um, who she was to Viola and what kind of work she was doing at Hull House? All right, so my dad used to start every workshop that I was in with him with a story about Neva Boyd. He always wanted us to know that Viola would never have created her work with if she hadn't have been lucky enough to find this great teacher, Neva Boyd. Right after high school, Neva went to work with Neva Boyd. She was um, she was a sociologist um, and a great proponent of the uses of play in education and social work. And she ran the recreational training school at Hull House. She was really active in the progressive era um, recreation movement and playground movement. Um, and at the recreational training school, she was training group workers, what we now call social workers, um, how to go out into the community and work with groups of all kinds. And to do this, she taught them folk dancing and storytelling and um, uh, get every type of game, table games and racing games and running games and, you know, physical games and chill, old children's games. Um, and so Viola had this training for, for several years before she got married um, uh, and, and had Paul. Um, and uh, she believed that play taught children many, many things, including the ability to work together as part of a group. Um, and a community and a democracy because she was so influenced by the progressives and Jane Adams. Um, she was she she talked about how play 
taught ch uh, children learn social values through play, um, which is, you know, uh, sort of like Jane Addams idea of social ethics. And she, um, but she what she really, she really argued that play worked so well as a healing activity was because children they did it was its own reward there was an adult an adult there telling kids <laughs> this is good for you this is what you need to do but because they it, they had their own motive to set up a game and keep it running you have to kind of keep everyone involved in the play and you have to meet the needs of the group to keep the game going otherwise people storm off in a huff or you know you have to negotiate all these things as and as a kid you'll do it because your goal is to keep the play going and um, and so in this way, uh, kids learn all sorts of um, uh, lessons about working together as part of a group, but also she really believed in the healing qualities of play because it gets us out of the head. And through those play experiences, we can build up new positive experiences, uh, like it, it, perhaps, you know, <laughs> and someone who might, you know, like a troubled kid, she argued, let them play and they'll have some like positive uh, experiences that build up their sense of self-worth through play. All right, great. Let's roll the clip. This is just a little moment from the film. On Neva Boyd's recommendation, Viola soon got the job of drama supervisor for the WPA at Hull House. Viola could now completely focus on developing a form of theater training that incorporated play. She was working with a lot of neighborhood kids who were immigrants and first generation. So she was working with a lot of people who didn't all necessarily share the same language. She knew from working with Neva Boyd that experiential education is what works. And so anytime she had a problem communicating a problem of the theater to her players, she would create a game so that they would learn through doing, they would learn through experience. My favorite example is that she was working on what was supposed to be sort of a romantic scene between a couple of teenagers, and they were very self-conscious, and their body language was very, you know, and she thought, well, that doesn't look too good. And so she invents a game called Contact. Could you hand me that glass? The idea of contact is that for every line you have with to another person, you have to make organic, logical, physical contact with them. Taste this. Tell me if it's dried. So they stopped thinking about how shy and, and inhibited they were. Mm. And mm. their point of concentration came to be, how can I cleverly respond to the challenge of the game to make physical contact with the other person in the scene? I'm pregnant. <laughs> oh, 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 hello! No, no, no. And they would do things, and she would say, oh, that's wonderful. That's got to be in the final Not show. in like a yay way. And so the show would be made up of a collection of the moments that they had come up with in response to her games, to her challenges. And they felt empowered by this and respected. So, the game Gibberish Interpreter made the players communicate physically, to show, not tell, which comes in handy when the players may speak different languages. The important part about pizza is making sure you get the dough just right. Gibberish is great. It just forces you to look into people's eyes and to pick up what their, what, what their body language is saying, because you are saying something. But it's it's in a language that you've just made up. Yes. <laughs> to me, pizza is all about the spit. Can we have an opening line for the scene? Octopi are on sale. Octopi are on sale. Audience suggestion. The most famous technique of improvisation was also first used by Viola students at Hull House. Octopuses are on sale, Kathleen. I didn't know that's what they were called. Hull House is ground zero. It's the big bang for improvisational theater in America. Some of these like neighborhood Hull House kids were the very first performing improvisers in the United States. Yay. <clears throat> When I first um, learned 
about the whole house connection, it just blew me away. It was one of the things that I did not know coming into this research. Um, all the early work was done in the service of community. And community is the word that comes up time and time again when discussing Viola and Paul's work. Um, so I thought that was beautiful. Um, Paul Sills said that improvisational theater is the closest thing you'll get, you'll find to democracy in theater. It opens up the possibility of play between people in the group and play is an expression of our equality. Uh, I mean, Francis and Angela, I mean, <laughs> that's a great concept. When it's working, uh, do you find that to be true? Absolutely, it is true democracy. Uh, and it is, you know, and I can speak to this, I think we can speak to this as women and people of color. Um, I think that that's really because you talk about uh, democracy and getting on stage and being able to be anyone and anything uh, is an empowering thing uh, that you you don't get all the time as a person of color or a woman. And so when you can step on stage and become anything in the universe that you can imagine. That is, that is democracy. And it's, it's challenging to everyone and transformative, I think, for everybody playing because of that. Because I remember like the first time I performed with Blue Co when I was in Turco on stage, we, you know, I did a set, we did an improv set. We got backstage and one of the, my cast members was like, you guys, we made Angela black in every scene, you know? And it was like, everybody sort of like looked at themselves for a minute. And I thought how powerful that moment was because it's something I couldn't have, communicated, you know, in just a conversation with anybody, like what it might feel like to kind of, I have people only have certain kind of conversations with me or, or think that that's how we could only, the only topic we could relate on. And in that moment, everybody was able to, they, we all learned something. And, and it was, I think in, in a, a, sm a big way, probably transformative for all of us and important. So it, it, there's a lot of experiences that can come out of it, not just the performance even. Wow, that's great. Um, I have a question from the audience. Um, Blaine asks, is there a specific trait that you can spot that tells, oh, this person has gone through the Spolin school? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Does anyone want to take it? <laughs> Anybody? Is there Readiness. a trait? Readiness. Readiness? Readiness. Yeah, my dad used to say, the readiness is all, you know. <laughs> That's Shakespeare, not Spolin, but uh, <laughs> just just being willingness to play, just play and, and willingness to play without knowing, uh, not like jumping in, even if you don't really understand the game, like being open to seeing what's going to happen, just being on the, you know, the balls of your feet ready for the serve. For me, that's, that's it. Right. I, I would say this versus this for foam. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 and space work. Very important. True. I did a play when I was about 23 that Alan Arkin was directing and Tony Holland and Andrew Duncan and yeah. Cynthia Harris and a lot of people who came from the Second City. And without anybody saying it, every time we weren't actually rehearsing, but calmly sitting there waiting for something to happen, somebody, and I was not experienced enough to be able to do this without feeling self-conscious, they bounced the ball back and forth. They would do, they would start <laughs> improvising just based on a peanut that they just found on the floor. It was so easy and it was so much like themselves. It was, it was the first time I realized that you could be doing something like that and not be showing off. It was just so natural that it came to you and you just played. Oh, which is what they did in the play. Did somebody, do you starting? Oh, okay. I, I, I was just saying bits, you know, oh. and you know, if you're an improviser, that's what you do is just bits. And, you know, Angela and I used to live upstairs and downstairs from each other and just continuously making each other laugh because why not? Yeah. <laughs> and I forget when you're not, you spend a lot of time around improvisers. Then when you're not, you, uh, you look around the room and you realize, oh, other people don't do this. <laughs> we look weird and crazy right now. I had a friend, we had a friend over and Francis and I were doing this bit where we're old, that we do all the time over these two old best friends. It's, it's really, you know, us, you know, much, much older, hopefully. And, um, we, you know, and, and we looked at the friend and he was like, what's going on? I'm like, oh, that's right. We're just playing. We're weird. 
<laughs> just playing. Exactly. A quick question um, for anybody who wants to take it. What do you think is different now about improv now than then? Hmm. Do you think there's anything different or is it? I do. Okay. I think, I, think there's more, I think there's a lot more improvisation as joke telling, which has a place, but it's, it's, and it's one of the, it's the most sort of financially rewarding part of improvisation, but the other part of improvisation where you don't know where you're going and it might be serious. And then it becomes funny because you didn't make it happen. Uh, there's less of that, but it doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but that's something I noticed there being more of and why not? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. All right. Um, Priya asks, I would love to know how her work had an impact on your lives, on a, like on your daily lives. Um, like you talked about making you a better person. How does it make you a better person? Kind of a thing. Who wants to take that? Sure. Uh, you know, absolutely. Um, Spolin's work, you talk about on my daily life. Uh, this is the house that Spolin built, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, the, the, her exercises, uh, everything, my entire career is based on, and my existence as an artist is based on Viola Spolin. That, I mean, I, I don't think that you can get more down to the root than that. Mm -hmm. I've heard it being, I've heard that her games are like uh, yoga for human connection. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was pretty cool comment. Um, all right, I just wanna look at the time, just do a quick time check and say um, uh, to all the viewers out there, let me see if I have any more coming in to me. I just wanna make sure. Um, thank you for your thoughtful questions out there, everyone. Uh, and now I just want to kind of give our um, panelists uh, a minute each for kind of final thoughts, anything that you know you want to talk about um, that I haven't brought up. I just want to give each of you uh, a chance to, to weigh in. Mark, do you wanna go first? Sure. Um, when, I, when I take all this in, and, and, and I'm not a performer by any means, and as I listen to this and the way it has impacted your lives, both professionally and personally, I, like I said earlier, I'm very moved by that. And I'm very interested in, we're in a very, very difficult uh, historical moment right now. We're returning after a full stop. And I had, I had been looking at this whole Chicago theater scene since from 1952 till about the pandemic, shortly before the pandemic. And I had always felt that the, the Spolin and the Sills stuff was just baked into the DNA of this community and it guided us. And I still believe that. I'll be very interested to see if it truly is baked into the DNA. Is it going to help us find our way into this next phase? I, I would like to believe it will. I, have, I actually have quite a lot of faith in the fact that it will, but it'll be interesting. That's what's on my mind right now. That's very, that's very I, I think so too. I have faith as well. Mm -hmm. um, Francis. Um, I'm just right now, I just grateful for the work, you know. Uh, I think that that's so part of the, the issue, the reason why I'm saying through the pandemic you know, um, it being able to connect with people that so many people have been able to improvise over Zoom and teach over Zoom. I mean, the, the work translates through and through, even in this medium, mm -hmm. which is what's wonderful. And so I'm just grateful for it. Mm -hmm. I love that. Angela? Um, yeah, my dogs are improvising right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I don't want to interrupt their flow, but uh, yeah, I agree with all that. And I think that I thank you for saying that, that both Mark and 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 Jude about having because I forgot for a minute. I was like, you know what? I can have hope <laughs> about right now, you know, because it's hard. And and but I think about it's so interesting to see. Like I think Ellen Alda was saying it earlier. Like the one time I'm not nervous is when I'm improvising. You know, wow. that's the time I feel most me when I have no idea what's coming next. And that, just remembering that night now in this discussion, thank you for that. Lovely, lovely. Bob? 
Well, I was thinking that it was funny that I completely forgot to mention that it took until I was like 48 and a half years old. But then I had like 10 years of Christopher Guest movies in which <laughs> I was actually putting whatever I had learned when I was 16 to actual work. Only it never occurred to me because when Chris calls and says, oh, well, we'd like you to be in this movie, he doesn't say, can you improvise? He just goes by whatever instinct he has. And from the beginning, everything about what he does is like if Viola were directing a movie, this is what she would have done. You don't rehearse anything. You're told that you you're told that you can move 10 feet to the left and 10 feet to the right. And then after that, you're not going to be in the scene. But there's no other thing that's told to you. You know the general idea of what's happening and who the other people are. And the trust that he, he entrusts you with is like his entire movie. And it, it spreads like wildfire and it's so freeing and it's, and it's all about listening as well. So it's, it's everything we've been talking about, but I totally forgot I had, I had done that. And also how much when I direct more now, I just sort of came to me in a flash that when I direct what I say to people is based on improvising. It's based on what did they do just now? What happened? What's supposed to happen in the play that I didn't know was supposed to happen, but I just saw a glimmer of it right now. I'm much better. I, I'm sort of formal about when I speak and I like to know what I'm going to say and all that in real life. But as a director, I'm much more able to say, you know, when you sat right down and you looked at him, this is blah, 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 blah. I can stay. I'm much more in the present as a director than I ever was before. And it's really helpful. Yeah, that's great. And Aretha, I'm going to give you the final word. Oh my goodness, this is, it's just been, thank you all to just to hear you speak about Paul and Viola has been so gratifying and is, and Jude, thank you for, I can't wait to watch and mm -hmm. um, you know, it's been my mission for a long time to spread the word about Viola because so many people don't know that not just that a woman created improvisation, but a community of women, the, you know, that that believed that a first generation Russian Jewish girl was worthy of this education and look what she did with it that's transformative right and that and we all need to be doing this right now for. Uh, you know, so I encourage all my players to become you know teachers and side coaches and uh, get kids playing and see what they're going to come up with that transforms the culture right because it's that was a. Um, but but to Mark's point about the pandemic. During, uh, I immediately, we went and we took our workshops on Zoom, wondering how we were gonna do this, this very physical embodied work. How mm -hmm. are we gonna bring it? And what happened was immediately as we began to build where together, begin build up settings, gather space objects and enter into them. And we started building wares where we couldn't go like Irish pubs or movie theaters or libraries. And then we'd enter into them and pass objects to each other. and. We start to feel that sense of community and connection, you know, that that we get in workshop, but we, it was never more powerful than when we couldn't actually be near other people. Right. And so just the just how much this work does um, to help us connect and, also, and, and entering into the present time through the focus calmed our nervous systems. We were in so much anxiety. Um, it really brought home um, some of the really primary lessons of and, uh, the fact that we were able to, like, like Aaron, I think Aaron Dati Roy called the pandemic like the the portal to the future, right? Like, I feel like yeah. Viola was all about getting us to enter the unknown without fear and and face the new, and and that we are all in this position where we need to do that right now. And I feel like her work is really helpful. Um, uh, to giving us the experience to do that. And so that's fabulous. That's lovely. I love it. Well, guys, our time is up. We, it does it for us. And a heartfelt, heartfelt thank you to Aretha Sills, Alan Alda, Bob Balaban, Mark Larson, Francis Collier, and Angela V. Shelton. I'm so appreciative that you took the time to be with me and kind of just hit on this subject. Uh, and to everybody out there, thank you for your questions. Inventing Improv, a Chicago Story special will premiere tomorrow night. Um, not tomorrow night, uh, Friday night, October 22nd at 8 p.m. in Chicago. Um, and you can go to wttw.com slash improv to see it there too. Uh, to dive a little further into Viola's Spolin story, visit wttw.com slash improv 
where there will be like a companion website too, where you can explore Spolin's legacy. There's a Q and A with uh, local improvisers revealing how improv has changed over the years. Uh, a story of the healing power of improv. Uh, there's some game demonstration videos and a map of improv theaters across the Chicago area that I hope will have full audiences for you know the future and now and ever to come so we can get this theater scene back up and running and profitable and thriving again. So once again, thank you for joining us and we hope you will tune in on Friday night. Good night, everyone. Good job, Jude. Thank you, Jude. Good night. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.